begin by talking about multiplexed flux capacitors. <laughs> but this is merely a cruel joke on Hanata in the translation booth, uh, to whom I have already promised that this will not be a technical talk. So I'd like to talk uh, about building a global Python community. And the Python community is as old as the language itself. Guido, when he first distributed uh, the, very, the very first copy of Python, uh, he clearly intended it to be a community product. And, and he's been behind the development of a community uh, ever since. But it took quite a while to build uh, anything that looked at all like a, a formal community. And there was this thing called the Python software activity. But the PSA had no membership fees. Uh, membership carried no obligations, and so really uh, it didn't make a, a great impact. But uh, when um, Python moved and the Python Labs team was starting in uh, the Zoop Corporation, uh, then the Python Software Foundation was formed, and uh, it was formed with two intentions. First of all, to promote and protect the Python language, and secondly, to try to grow uh, a diverse international community. So the Python Software Foundation is a registered nonprofit, which means that people, uh, individuals in the UK, can make tax-deductible uh, donations. It's a, a membership organization. If you want to join, an existing member has to nominate you, and then the members have periodical votes uh, where new members are typically accepted. I can't remember uh, any membership nomination being rejected, although the number of votes will, will vary according to the individual and how well known they are and how well known their work is. Uh, sponsor members are normally commercial organizations. They actually pay between $2,000 and $25,000 according to their size and the level of generosity uh, that they have. And uh, the Python Software Foundation tries to fund as many community building activities and as many support activities as it can. And so we support uh, sprints and technical projects with funding. Uh, we support conferences with funding. Uh, as you may have noticed, the Python Software Foundation uh, is one of the sponsors of uh, Python Brazil. So I was nominated to membership of the foundation in 2003 uh, at the end of the very first PyCon. I chaired the first three uh, PyCons. And uh, I joined the board a year later. And when Stefan Deibel, my predecessor as chairman, uh, resigned as chair, uh, I became chairman instead. Uh, at the time I became chairman, the foundation was owed almost $100,000, which it hadn't uh, been trying hard enough to collect, and there was no formal administration, there was no budget, uh, there was no particular plan or, or decision about where to go, uh, and there were no formal mechanisms to uh, reach out to the community and to find out uh, what was going on. Now, one of the difficulties that we have as geeks is trying to solve non-technical problems. And the problems of the Python Software Foundation and the problems of building a global community are not primarily technical problems. They're social problems, possibly political problems, uh, but they aren't technical. Now, this is difficult for programmers because a programmer's first instinct, whenever they come across a problem, is to solve it uh, by inventing a new technology or by creating uh, a technological solution. But organizational issues are much more significant than technical ones. And so eventually I realized that if the foundation was going to make rapid forward progress, uh, we needed some uh, serious professional administration. So we hired a part-time administrator uh, who became a full-time administrator. And although we don't uh, still work quite as perfectly as we might, uh, I like to think that, that things have got better since we had the support of Pat Campbell. 
our administrator. Now, if you think about the value of the skills that you possess, I presume, is everyone here a programmer? Put your hand up if you write code. Okay. So, if we have you run conferences, or manage mailing lists, or solicit donations, or maintain web pages, or anything like that, that's time that you cannot spend programming. So, if you think about it, having people like you run conferences is, to a certain extent, a waste of effort. Now, I know that programmers can do these things, and sometimes will do them quite well. But wouldn't it be so much better for the development of Python if we had people who didn't have programming skills, but who were able to do all these other things that, that running any kind of community involves? In order to attract those people, we need to diversify the community. And we need people with accounting skills, we need people who are able to uh, advise us on legal matters, and of course, uh, advice on legal matters is very dependent on the particular jurisdiction. So a US lawyer can't be any use at all uh, to a Brazilian user group, for example. We need clerical help. We need help, I know it's a dirty word in many terms, but we need to market the, the foundations and the communities. If we're going to bring more people into the community, then we need to project the community uh, out into the population at large. And we need to demonstrate that there's a, an attractive option there for people. There's something useful for them to do. Uh, the website is a very good example. At the moment, if you don't understand, uh, I think they're still using subversion for version control. If you don't understand subversion, if you don't understand the make system, then it's impossible for you uh, to implement a new page or, or to update content in the python.org website. And that's something that I think we ought to fix. So when I talk about building a diverse global community, uh, there are many different ways in which a community can be uh, diverse. And so here are some of the ways uh, in which diversity is desirable. Uh, and of course, not all cultures are equally accepting of diversity. So in, in some places, is that me or did somebody just tread on a cable? You probably tread it. Hello? Okay, can I have the hand mic maybe? Ah, oh, no, it's come back. Good, okay. So in some cultures, uh, first of all, we have to persuade people of the need for diversity. Uh, before we can establish diversity. And so uh, it's not something that we can expect to achieve immediately. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes persuasion. And we have to learn to do that persuasion because if people don't accept the need for diversity, then we will never uh, have them implement diversity. So everyone has uh, a certain degree of privilege. I happen to be uh, a white male living in a very uh, prosperous Western country. So I have a, a huge degree of privilege compared, well, thinking of a simple example, compared with, you know, for example, the staff who were, uh, who were looking after me uh, in the hotel that I, I stayed at last night. Uh, I'm much more privileged than they are. And it's important to understand uh, how privileged one is uh, and just how many people there are who do not uh, naturally receive the benefits from society and from community membership that we do. And I would like the Python community to stand uh, at the front of this uh, wave of diversity and to uh, encourage the open source world as a whole uh, to increase its level of diversity. So one of the things that I have managed to achieve as chairman of the foundation is uh, to have the, the foundation publish a diversity statement, which you can see up here. And I think the words in blue are the most significant. Now, you will remember there are many aspects of diversity, as I pointed out there. And uh, we decided when we generated the statement that we didn't want to include every specific aspect of diversity uh, because if you try and do that, there will always be someone 
who is omitted by uh, negligence or ignorance. And so we simply wanted to stress the inclusive nature of the Python community. And so our principles are those of mutual respect, tolerance, and encouragement for each other. And the idea is that anybody with useful skills should feel comfortable coming along and becoming a part of the Python community without necessarily being a Python programmer. Now, developing that diversity statement was a, a very interesting lesson indeed. I discovered that when people talk about diversity, it's very easy for them to understand each other. And so, on the mailing list, uh, where the diversity statement was formed, people were constantly arguing because one person would misinterpret somebody else's mail and they would assume that something had been meant which had not been meant and emotions would suddenly start to run high, people would argue and all of a sudden we're no longer talking about how to achieve diversity, we're talking about how to stop these people arguing amongst themselves and how we can all try and move forward together. So I found it was necessary to be very explicit in my communications. And that doesn't just apply to, to human language, of course. In computer languages and, and other technical spheres, we have similar things. So um, it's difficult sometimes for a lawyer to speak to a, a, a geek because they speak different languages. They have different jargons. Uh, it's different sometimes uh, for uh, us to communicate effectively. I know if I could speak in Portuguese, which sadly I can't, uh, then I would be able to communicate my ideas more effectively. And I'm very grateful that the conference organizers have chosen to provide translation uh, so that my ideas will be more effectively communicated. Uh, but it also means that it's important for the Python community to be represented in the different nations of the world by people of those nations. We can't have the US-based Python Software Foundation representing uh, Icelandic people or, or Brazilian people because we simply, A, we don't have the language, and B, we don't have the understanding uh, of the culture, which is so important when you're talking to, uh, to government. Now, as I look across this room, I see that, as usual, there are a relatively low number of women in the, in the audience, even though, of course, women are actually 50% of humanity. And this is an area where, particularly in the United States, uh, the open source world is significantly behind technical industries, uh, even though the technical industries themselves are still not mirroring society uh, as a whole. And unfortunately, a lot of men are quite happy with the situation. They don't realize uh, that women are just as good at programming as men. And if you don't have uh, your quota of women, then you don't have your quota of technical skills. So we're, again, losing effort by not including women. And of course, when women complain about issues of bias against them or um, you know, biased language and whatever, uh, typically you will find that many men will uh, comment on these posts uh, uh, and uh, in a fairly negative way as well. Whoop, what happened there? Okay. So, we need to be a welcoming community. We need to explicitly let people know that we want them to join. Uh, if anybody's ever spent time on the Python dev list, then you probably know that the, the developers are fairly direct in their criticism of technical proposals. And so, uh, several times I noticed that someone would make a first post on Python Dev, they would receive some uh, explicit criticism of their ideas, which was probably justified, but it wasn't really calculated to make someone feel welcome. And so the people would, would never appear on the, on the Python Dev list again. So to try to uh, avoid um, people failing at the first hurdle to join the technical community, uh, Jesse Nola started a list called the Core Mentorship List. Uh, and that's populated by developers who actually understand uh, that people need rather gentler treatment uh, as they uh, make their first tentative steps 
in the community. Uh, and so uh, several people have, as a result of the creation of that list, uh, now made their first uh, commits to the uh, source tree and become, uh, become full status uh, developers. Another thing we need to do is we need to understand that if we're asking people to, to suggest improvements to Python, then we need to give them a suitable way to do it. And if someone isn't a, a fully competent professional programmer, then the Python bug tracker is a very, very difficult thing to use. I've been programming now for 44 years, and I still had to ask someone how to create an account on the bug tracker. So you could, you could think of me as stupid or old or something like that, but it was difficult for me. I'm sure it's going to be difficult for other people as well. So we need a friendlier interface uh, that people approach before they ever get to the bug tracker so that we can tell them, well, actually, this is a known problem or somebody else already reported this. We can have someone uh, a pre uh, just interpret the bug tracker for them, if you like. It's also very, very important uh, to recognize the efforts that people make. And I was very glad to see uh, presentations being made before these, these talks. Uh, if you don't uh, show people how much you appreciate their efforts, then it's likely they'll just go somewhere else where their efforts receive more visible appreciation. And although thank you is an easy thing to say, it can have enormous effects, and I think it's important to remember that. So another of the achievements of my time as a director of the foundation has been to institute the Community Service Awards, which are awarded four times a year, so eight people each year receive a Community Service Award. And also, O'Reilly fund the Frank Willison Award uh, in memory of someone who was uh, very, very friendly indeed to the, to the Python community. Uh, and that's presented or announced uh, every year uh, at OSCON. Diversity is so important that we can't really let politics get in the way. Uh, we need as a community to, to collaborate internationally. And so it's important then to make sure uh, that we don't fragment our efforts. If our political leaders disagree, well, let them disagree. Let's not, let's not let that affect the work that, that we do. We need to be a, a fully international community to avoid wasting efforts. And if we're going to be a global community, then I think we need to build a global infrastructure as well. We do have an infrastructure at the PSF at the moment. We have the python.org site, which, as I've said, is difficult to maintain. Uh, and I hope that shortly, the foundation will be issuing a, a request for proposals to have the site re-implemented uh, using technology that will allow a much broader range of people to more easily contribute content uh, and that will hopefully also make it possible uh, to more easily produce multilingual content in the python.org website. Uh, recently we switched from uh, Subversion to Mercurial and that was a, a, a very long drawn out exercise. It took far too long. Uh, an example of, of really of, of how not to do things. A decision was made uh, but uh, after the decision was made, some technical issues emerged. Uh, since those technical issues only affected Windows developers, the development community could have decided to ignore them and, and put Windows developers to uh, a greater degree of inconvenience. Unfortunately, they chose instead uh, not to implement Mercurial until the technical problems were solved. And so that decision took two years to implement, and it was uh, not at all helpful. Now, the foundation has grown in many ways since it was started. Um, PyCon US is uh, generating significant profits uh, now. We had one bad year in 2009 where the global economy took a, a terrible dip, uh, and that hurt us as well. Uh, sponsor members are helping uh, fund the organization by uh, supporting the, the higher scale of membership fees which we introduced last year. Uh, we're about to introduce an associate membership scheme which will bring more money into the foundation. 
And so uh, not only do we have more money uh, to dispose of, we have more money to support community initiatives throughout the world, uh, but we are also able uh, to request funds. We are now um, more credible uh, as a recipient of funds, and I think as a result of having seen what we've done with the money which we've received so far, I think donors are starting to realize that the Python Software Foundation can help uh, develop the Python world. So a centralized organization is not going to be enough in a global, for a global community. And this means that we have to seek, the, the foundation has to seek cooperation uh, with various national groups. Uh, that's why I was quite interested uh, to hear that the Association Python uh, Brazil uh, is considering uh, terminating its own existence. I think, personally, uh, that that would make it very difficult for the Python Software Foundation uh, to interact with the Brazilian Python community, because if there's no single point of representation, that would mean that we had to reach out to many diverse individuals, which would make our job much more difficult indeed. So, uh, I understand I don't have a vote in this matter, but I would very much like to suggest that you do consider keeping the association Python Brazil alive. Uh, four years ago, if somebody had thrown a million dollars at the Python Software Foundation, it would have been an embarrassment. We weren't prepared, uh, we, weren't, we would not have been able to put that money to good use. Nowadays, I feel more confident uh, that we could. Our reserves, while still relatively low, are improving. And I think as well that um, we will see that there's a lot of goodwill towards Python in the technical world. We have strong, significant friends in the industry. Some of them small, like Active State, some of them large, like Google. But these people are using Python, they see its value, they want to see Python move forward. And so we need to start a dialogue about how we build a global Python community and what its goals should be. Now, I'm a great believer in goals. I think if you don't have goals, then you don't have any control over the direction that you move in. I personally see goals as, uh, or plans as a means of determining how far off course you are. So if, if this is where you are now, and that's where you want to be, then the plan describes a straight line. So you start to head towards your goal, and inevitably you may veer off. So then you look at the plan versus your actual position, and you correct to go back on course. Now this isn't to say that if, as you veer off course, you see another more desirable goal, it's perfectly okay to replan. So planning, in my opinion, doesn't constrain you. It simply helps you to maintain a chosen direction until you find a more desirable direction, or of course, until you reach your goal and replan. So we've got a number of issues in the foundation at the moment. First of all, I think, I would like to address the issue of the Python package index. This is becoming a crucial component uh, in many Python installations. And so if it fails, uh, then we cause installs to fail. And uh, there are already some problems, not major problems, but people do complain occasionally that the, the package index is down and they can't run their installs. So I think we need to do something to make sure that PyPI uh, supports the world that it has created. I think it's important to broaden membership of the organization. Uh, the associate membership scheme will allow people to uh, join the foundation as associate members for a, uh, an annual fee. But I think as well we need to make sure that the core members of the Python community in countries all over the world uh, are nominated to the, the foundation membership. Uh, and that they, as members, then start uh, to recruit other members from the national communities. I think only then will we start to see the growth of a, a truly international uh, Python software foundation. We also need an assistant treasurer. So if anybody knows a good accountant who would like to work uh, for no money at all for a non-profit, I hope you'll let me know. 
So let's just look at a few quick goals. These are not uh, by any means the official goals of the PSF. These are just goals which I personally feel uh, are desirable and which I would like to see the international Python community get behind. I think it's important to acknowledge that we should try to uh, increase the female membership of the foundation. Uh, that's a very simple goal. We can measure it very easily. Uh, whether it's achievable or not, well, that's up to you. I don't, I don't see a huge number of women in this room, but I don't see none, so at least there's some encouragement. We do have some women here, and I hope we'll have more. Um, I think it is realistic to say that the foundation should at least uh, approach industry norms. And that's not just because uh, you know, society contains a certain number of women, so the foundation should contain a certain number of women. It's actually the case that women frequently choose to do things different ways. And you never know. The men may have something to learn from that. It's important to update the website. And I think we should have a content management system, uh, let's say, by two years from now. This is not as simple a goal as I would like, uh, and not perhaps too easy to measure. Uh, but let's face it, if we have all this technology in the Python world, uh, and we can't achieve an update of our website technology, then really, we should just go home. I think it's also important to try to support all implementations, all major implementations of Python, uh, in their goal of upgrading to Python 3. Uh, this is a relatively simple thing and relatively easy to measure, uh, but I'm not sure how achievable it is. I know that uh, the Jython team, for example, has suffered some attrition uh, recently, uh, and there's not much effort going into Jython development. But I do want everyone to know that the foundation doesn't just support uh, C Python, it supports the other major implementations as well, as we demonstrated uh, at PyCon this year with a $10,000 award uh, to the PyPy team. I would like to see a content delivery network for PyPI uh, in two years, if I can. Um, I don't see why this shouldn't be an, an achievable goal, and we certainly have a time scale for it. I think it's great to have a single site for people to submit packages to the index, but I think in order for the index to be uh, available everywhere, then really we need a content delivery network which allows users to use the package index without having to configure complex mirroring systems. They shouldn't need to know uh, about any of that. And I also think it's important if we, if we are to take seriously our goals of building an international community, then we have to take seriously the fact that at the moment, non-US membership of the foundation stands at less than 10%, possibly uh, less than 5%. Now, for this to succeed, the stimulus should primarily come from outside the United States. And I understand that uh, if a country doesn't have any PSF members, it's very difficult to acquire the first ones. But I believe we, we do have some. Do we have any PSF members in the room from Brazil? No. Okay. Well, it's time we did. It's time we did. And I hope that you'll all start to propose people or ask members to propose people. I know Jim Fulton's a member of the foundation. Alan Runyon's a member of the foundation. I'm a member of the foundation, Machi is a member of the foundation, so there are members you should be telling them who should be nominated because we can increase Brazilian membership that way most rapidly. So, this is not going to happen without a certain amount of work. We need to be able to imagine the future community. We need to be determined to make the community that we want to see. We need to be able to cooperate so that we can work together uh, towards the same end. It needs a lot of hard work, and I hope that the Brazilian team is going to be uh, a part of that hard work. As the chairman of the PSF, I sometimes feel I have an unenviable job, because you cannot, in the open source world, coerce people. You can't threaten to fire them. People work as volunteers, and so, Basically, we have to have good goals which people will agree with. If people agree with our goals, then I believe that they will help us uh, to work towards achieving them. 
And so, uh, in order to get people behind the goals, we have to persuade them uh, that they're worthwhile. So, if you want to know who I'm talking to, I'm talking to you. People are the prime currency of a software, an open source software community. People are the most valuable attribute that the Python community has. And I, I particularly liked uh, a comment by uh, Enrique Bastos in his uh, lightning talk at uh, PyCon this year, where he said, you don't build a community, you organize events, and the people who come to those events are your community. And I know, particularly when you've lost one of your heroes, that it's, it's, it's easy to feel that without such a leader, uh, no progress will be made. But you will be surprised. You will be surprised. If you continue to work towards desirable goals, new heroes will emerge. Heroes aren't born, they're made. And they're made by doing things. And I'd like to try to help them, if I possibly could, to do much more. So thank you very much for listening to me. And I hope I'll have many things to <laughs> Technology always gets in the way. Isn't there a Python system that can do this? Yeah. These, guys, these guys like the heroes for no one. Okay, Lucien, I can. Então, uh, porque o Steve comentou uma, uma coisa que eu não sei até que ponto a maioria das pessoas aqui estão a par, ou sabem qual é o contexto e tal, né? Ele falou sobre uh, o papo de fechar a Associação Cartão Brasil, etc. E tal, né? Bom, então, uh, eu, queria, eu, eu queria falar uh, três coisinhas a respeito disso. Né? Primeiro que o meu entendimento é que uh, o Eric colocou sobre isso e foi um desafio, foi, foi, um, foi uma coisa para sacudir as pessoas, entendeu? Uh, e eu acho que isso foi uma grande contribuição, né? valeu. Tá? Acho que foi legal mesmo. É importante a gente sacudir mesmo, porque uh, precisamos renovar. Né? Mas a segunda uh, coisa que eu queria falar é que hoje, no final do, do dia, tá? é, acho que provavelmente vai vir falar isso, tá? mas eu vou falar, é a, a, a Assembleia Anual da Associação Cartão Brasil. Tá? Então, por favor, eu gostaria de ver tipo, quatro vezes mais pessoas nessa Assembleia do que tinha... Uh, Bom, infelizmente na última eu não fui no Curitiba, mas na outra, tá? Porque é o momento de vocês entenderem quais são os problemas que a gente está lidando, o que a gente está tendo a resolver, etc e tal, tá? Então, eu queria muito aproveitar essa oportunidade, porque eu tive o privilégio, quando eu estive lá na, na Paico Americana, de, de ir convidar para o encontro deles. A nossa, a nossa, na verdade, organização é mais aberta. Qualquer um pode assistir a, a Assembleia, tá? Mas para votar tem que ser membro efetivo. Mas a terceira coisa que eu queria falar é o seguinte, nós todos ah, admiramos, eu não quero ser piegas, tá? mas é que eu vou, eu, vou, eu vou declarar um fato, certo? Todo mundo que conheceu o Dornelis sabe que o Dornelis era um cara sensacional, que ia atrás, entendeu? que fazia, que acontecia, que ajudava todo mundo 24 
faturados por dia, né? e etc. Pois então, gente, o Dom Nélias acreditava na Associação Aberto Brasil. Tá? Eu sei porque a gente trabalhou muito junto para fazer o começo, o começo, e uma coisa que é muito importante que ele falou assim, qual é o objetivo da Associação Aberto Brasil? Eu estava pensando, na verdade a gente está meio sem, sem rumo, porque o trabalho de institucionalizar a Associação Aberto Brasil foi tão grande que essa era a nossa primeira meta. A nossa primeira meta era ter um CNPJ, para ele ter um estatuto aprovado no cartório, para poder ter um CNPJ, para poder ter uma conta bancária, para poder receber patrocínios, para poder trazer o Steve Holden e todo esse pessoal que está aqui. Percebe? E a gente chegou lá. E aí? E aí a gente ficou meio sem rumo. Na verdade, esse é o ponto que nós estamos. Nós construímos um negócio que é super importante, só que agora a gente precisa dar o próximo passo. Tá? E a perda do, do Dom é uma coisa que lógico que causou um efeito. Uh, eu, vou, eu vou confessar duas coisas. Primeiro, eu fui maquiavelo. Eu convidei o Steve Holden depois, duas semanas depois do Dom Nélis ter falecido. Eu estava com o cara Henrique. Ah, o Henrique está aqui. Estava com o Henrique, sinceramente, eu queria desistir de fazer a Python Brasil. Porque tem entre nós. Quem conheceu... A, essa Python Brasil, eu só estou fazendo porque o Dom Nélis pediu, porque não ia ter Python Brasil esse ano. Uh, porque... Ninguém se ofereceu. A gente tinha uma proposta do pessoal do Cerno. Para quem não lembra, o meu evento do Cerno foi cancelado, que não tem esse ano. Então, o que, o que eu acho importante é a vinda do Steve é exatamente um passo, é um passo até maquiavélico. Aquele meu blog post de fechar a, porta, fechar a lojinha da Python Brasil. Ele foi pensado para mexer com as pessoas, foi pensado para tirar o Luciano da aposentadoria. Tá certo? É, bem, é ser bem sincero, bem canalha. É, foi, foi pensado para pegar aquele rapaz de boné, levanta a mão ali, que também estava aposentado. Foi pensado para pegar o, o Senra. Foi para pegar algumas das pessoas que eram da velha guarda e que estavam distantes, não para trazer para o dia a dia, mas para trazer para a discussão. Né? Porque hoje nós temos um pessoal novo muito bom. Hoje eu tenho o Henrique, hoje eu tenho o Álvaro, hoje eu tenho a Tânia, hoje eu tenho o Douglas. Hoje eu tenho aqui... Aliás, quem, quem aqui não é associado da Associação Python Brasil? Ó. Oh. Tá, você... Aliás, Steve. Yep. That guy over there, you know? The one with brown shirt. Uh -huh. The one looking ashamed. He's <laughs> the Brazilian member of the Python Software Foundation. Ah, good. I was kind of... Okay. Oh, okay. he might, he might. He was kind of holding, you know. Okay, now Eric, yeah. Eric, yeah. Eric, I I take the point that sometimes people don't realize how much they value something until they're faced with the possibility of losing it. So I think you've probably done the, the Association Python Brazil a favor by writing that blog, and I wanted to refer to it in my talk to let you know that it had received international attention. But it's also a dangerous game because you run the risk that people will simply shrug their shoulders and walk away. I'm very glad to see that that's not going to be happening. Yeah. Uh, um ponto importante é, vocês uh, sabem que a, a Associação Python Brasil é importante, ela não é essencial para a, para a comunidade Python, a comunidade Python existia antes e ela vai existir depois, ela é importante para uma série de coisas, a gente estava na, na Argentina na semana passada e o Facundo mesmo falou, pois é, a gente faz milhares de coisas ótimas, só que a gente chegou num ponto onde a gente precisa pedir favor para a, a associação Via Libre para conseguir receber dinheiro da Python Software Foundation. A gente quer falar com o governo e a gente não é recebido. Então, existe um propósito. E tem muita gente boa. E tem muita gente boa, capaz e com vontade. Ok? E essa palestra é inspiradora. A palestra que o Henrique vai dar, que por acaso está no mesmo dia, olha que interessante. Tem uma série de palestras de comunidade hoje. Elas são inspiradoras para se pensar, para a discussão, que é hoje, no final do dia. Esteja na Assembleia. Ah, eu não faço parte da, da PIB. Esteja aqui. Você pode não votar, mas você pode ouvir, você pode falar. Hoje, sete horas, 
ok? A gente vai ter as Lightning Talks, sete horas começa a Assembleia da PIB. Eu vou fazer uma breve, um breve resumo de como foi o processo da Python Brasil. Ok, e aí a gente I, fala. I should like to intercede on behalf of the audience, who are now 15 minutes past their coffee break time and have listened to us all very patiently. Thank you very much once again.